Hello everybody. Um, my name's Richard Johnston. I'm the Chief Executive of Vendemol Shine in the UK and I'm also Chair of Creative Skillset, who are the, the sponsors of this session. And we're here today to talk about high-end drama, um, how to keep it booming. So it's been in many ways a very exciting story over the last five or six years. Um, spend on high-end drama in the UK, TV, has risen from around 600 million to over 1.1 billion in the last year. So it's almost doubled over the last five years. And that doesn't even include film, which has also seen a similar, similar growth. Much of it fueled, of course, by inward investment. Um, so although part of this growth is, 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 a, is a global growth in, in drama production, driven by the Netflixes of the world, um, there's also been a massive increase in the attractiveness of making drama in the UK. Um, partly the talent we have here, of course, but also driven by the tax credits, which have been a, a huge success. Um, and also more recently, in, indeed, by the exchange rate, which has made it a lot cheaper to produce drama here as well. So in many ways, it's been a really exciting time um, for producers, for writers, uh, and for crews. Big, uh, it's been a big boom. But with all, as with all growth, it, it's, it doesn't come without challenges. And the biggest challenge, I think, facing the industry at the moment is, is around the shortage of talent, the shortage of skills. Um, and I think our, our session today is very much going to be about how we look to address that. What, do we, what can we do as an industry to try and get more people into the industry, more training, more skills, more diversity in, in, into the, into the high-end industry? And we've got a fantastic panel here to help me, help me dissect this. Firstly, on my left is uh, Frith Tiplady, a, a long-term colleague as uh, Tiger Aspect, um, and uh, ended up there as co-MD of Tiger Drama across many of the biggest dramas, Peaky Blinders, Fortitude, etc. And last year left to set up Moon Age Pictures. Um, next we have Danny Brocklehurst, uh, the award-winning, BAFTA-winning and Emmy-winning uh, writer. Um, most recently for shows... National Emmy, let's not get carried <laughs> away. <laughs> Still, it all counts, though. <laughs> um, and more, most recently uh, written the written Safe with, uh, for Netflix and Come Home for BBC. Uh, next, we have Kay Elliott, who oversees the high-end TV levy skills fund for, for creative skill sets and is responsible for uh, overseeing the strategy and also the provision of training, first-class training for crews and talent across the UK. And on the end, we have Claire Mondell, who I'm going to say is Scotland's leading drama producer. Um, the company <laughs> Synchronicity Films, and very excitingly, have a big new BBC drama coming any day now with Jenna Coleman called yep. The Cry. Yep, that's right. Starts very, very soon. Very Quite soon. Quite soon. Yeah. Um, so, but before we get into the the meat of the session, let's have a little look at um, some of the amazing drama that's been made in the UK in the last two or three years. <laughs> well done, us. <laughs> Um, so, um, start with, with Frith. Um, obviously, as, as I mentioned, you've, you've worked on many of the, the biggest UK dramas, including Peaky Blinders, Fortitude, and currently Curfew, um, uh, one of Sky's biggest ever commissions. Um, how, how do you see it? What, what sort of issues are you encountering around the availability of crews and, and talent? Well, in some levels, it's amazing. We're getting to do really amazing work that we probably never dreamed of. Um, Curfews are sort of Fast and the Furious kind of drama. That wouldn't have been conceived like about 10 years ago. So the boom is allowing writers and directors and producers to think bigger and wilder. But along with that comes real technical demands. The size of crews are bigger. We're doing eight to 10 episodes. Um, and so it's the number of crew that we need is more. And then that level of crew needs to be really sometimes specialised, but also um, just knowledgeable and experienced. And there is definitely a gap with, with that. But it's also, it, it is to do with numbers, like a standard, if there's such a thing, drama shoot used to have a, a line producer, coordinator, secretary and runner, for example, with the production team. Curfew had a co-producer, line producer and three production managers. And that's before I've even got into the rest of it. So the, the, the scale of what we're doing is unbelievably exciting and the opportunity is really exciting, but that isn't, it doesn't, you just don't suddenly have a workforce that can deal with all of that. So we took on quite a few training and moving people up really seriously um, and giving opportunities to a lot of people. But with that comes, 
more investment from those people higher up the chain, not only training, but giving time, giving feedback and, and so on, and let alone recruiting and giving opportunity. So it, it's, it's good, but it's, it's adding another layer of complexity to what we're doing, definitely. And, and, and do you have, what specific examples do you see of where, where you know, you, you're really struggling to find? What, what sort of... I, I, Honestly, and it's not very interesting, it, it is across the board to do with numbers. Um, again, curfew had a location team of 11, I used to do it with two. So the scale of what we're doing is one part of the story. Um, I think the other thing is we, the industry went, everyone sort of forgets about eight years ago, we weren't just quiet, we were really quiet. So we almost came from sort of a standing start. Lots of people had left the industry. A lot of people um, had come, those sort of the ex sort of Granada BBC trained people had were coming to the end of their careers. So it, it, it's become a massive boom in terms of what needs to be done. So that... We've come from a very low base. Very so. low base and sort of training people up fast and good. And, some, and I include myself in that. For me, it came from a perfect time. I'd been used to doing really great dramas in Manchester of a certain level. And then suddenly I'm in Iceland doing a massive, massive show with Hollywood stars. I mean, it's so exciting and brilliant. But then bringing up people behind you, I was a runner for four years. It took a long time. And so you're having to fast track people. And now those people are training other other people to fast track behind them and as producers we really need to make sure that people are safe know what they're doing learn make sure experiences are good and that people come through that system ta talented and knowledgeable and that's that's the trickiness at the moment uh, and what, what impact do you think the the SVODs, the OTTs have had on, on the market um is it all a good thing or is it as a producer amazing <laughs> um, in terms of the industry i think it's added a level of confusion to everybody um for example peaky is perceived as a netflix show but we made that it only got sold to netflix uh, season three so that money is not it, it flows via the distribution company but as a producer i i'm not an it's not a netflix show so i think that assumption is really, really tricky, and I think it's really hard for crews to navigate. And if I'm a crew, why on one job should I only be getting £200 a day and the next I get 400 I'm doing the same day's work. Mm. There is a legitimate argument to that question, but there is a lot of difference if you are doing, I don't know, say a cold feet to a curfew. They're different jobs doing different things. And I get that a crew person on the ground goes, I've worked for 10 days, 10 hours, why aren't I getting the same money? But they are different things. And I think that confusion f spread through to writers and uh, artists. We used to employ people and then if it was successful, you got money later down the line, the SWOD approach pays you more upfront. That's a yeah. different <laughs> level of challenge. But um, so I think, I think it's, I think it's, confusing for people at the moment and I think it's confusing for agents and crew to navigate but that doesn't say it's bad I just know that line producers like Danny show safe it was a Netflix show you know it's not hasn't got the budget of the crown I'm guessing <laughs> so that was um not you yet. know and that's the problem that these shows are sort of out there and people love them and therefore they assume that ev there's lots of money floating around that's not necessarily the case and I guess also we've got some Hollywood block many more Hollywood blockbusters being made in the UK now as well which to some extent suck up some of the, the yeah I well. mean I think they're different I mean close they're different in London it's always been the case you sort of have quite a definite TV crew and a, 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 a film crew I think regionally it's more you work when whatever mm. great work comes yep. that way I think in a way what's been great for the TV community is actually we're really good if not better than film people at making television I can budget with one script and make a 10 episode drama a film person doesn't like well that's a script and it's not going to change that's not my special my speciality is working with a writer and producer and together making some making that budget work and push it as far as we can films get budgeted they're made on the budget budgeting that page that's a it's a different skill yeah and moving on to danny for a second um as as you know as, as a writer how, how what impact has it had on you with the, the boom have you what have you noticed that's a um, challenge, particularly over the last two or three years. I mean, you, you know, I think from a writing point of view, 
um, it, I, I would say it's a positive thing, really, because, you know, just simply because you've got more places to, to go to. Mm. Um, it doesn't seem all that long ago that really your only options were kind of, you know, three places in the, in the UK. And, yeah. You know, if they all passed, then you were, you were sunk. Um, so I think just simply, you know, to have more options is, is, a, is a positive thing. Yeah. Um, you know, I think... I, I absolutely, you know, I've, I've worked for I've worked for BBC a lot. I've worked for Channel Four um, and ITV, you know, and I, and I really enjoy working for those places. But like the experience of working for for Netflix was just it's kind of bizarre because suddenly you're doing a show for the world, you know. I mean, we did a call the other day with Netflix, and they sent us some graphics and all this kind of stuff, and they're literally going, "It was a it was a hit here in this country," you know, a map, a color coded map of where your show is a hit yeah. or, you know, it's, it's a very different experience, you know, and, and how quickly people watched it and binged it, you know, and, and all this kind of thing. So I, 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 you know, largely I think it's a positive thing, but I think it's like Fritzer, I think it's all sort of taken us all a bit, you know, we're still sort of feeling our way through what it means for the UK industry, but also how, um, where the opportunities are, you know. And uh, in terms of, um I mean, one of the issues I think there has been, you know, the industry's quite risk averse in many ways. Do you think we're good enough at letting, giving new people a go? Um, directors, for instance, yeah. as well as writers? Well, you know, the, 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 the difficulty um, has, has, always, has always been that I've found that, that once you, whether you suggest a new writer or whether you suggest a new director, um, there has been a resistance simply because people are worried about uh, that person having enough experience and 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 doing the job properly, meeting deadlines, whatever it is. Um, I mean, w th so this, you know, the story I, I wanted to tell about when we worked on Come Home um, was that w we were, you know, we had a three-parter for the BBC, authored piece, really, you know, really quite emotional, and it's the sort of show really that. I'd say a few years ago, you would have want, you, a lot of directors would have wanted to do because they, they could have come in, they sort of like my, you know, it's almost like you're making a long film. Um, and yet, the, the, you know, there was, a, there was a real shortage of the sort of usual suspects, if you like, because they were all off doing things and there was so, there's so much work and, you know, di directors are in such demand that we kind of had to sort of rethink our strategy. Um, and we... We interviewed some some newer some newer directors and, and Andrea Harkin Andrea Harkin um, really impressed us uh, just with her vision for the show, but she was very 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 new. I mean, not that long out of film school, she'd done one thing for TV, and we took we took a chance on Andrea. It was a chance, you know, and I think I think it really paid off because I think she gave her heart and soul to it, and I think she did an absolutely brilliant job. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I think there, there are positives, perhaps, yes. in, in the boom. That, yeah, you know, no, absolutely. The, 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 simply the lack of people available means that you might take a chance on new people. You have to take more risks, yeah. So, Kay, from, obviously you oversee the high-end TV levy uh, and, in a sense, are responsible for trying to solve a lot of the issues mm -hmm. that, that Frith and Danny have just spoken about. Can you tell us a little bit about how, what high-end TV levy focuses on and what your key objectives are over the next year or two? Yeah, I mean, it is, it is a massive challenge, so exactly to the point that's been made. I mean, um, the, the industry is just, the growth has been phenomenal, brilliant, amazing. It's, isn't that wonderful? But obviously it does mean that there, that comes with challenges, and often those are around skills, of course. Um, and I think there's two things. I mean, for me, the work that we do, we've kind of, we've turned things around quite quickly in terms of every um, investment that we make is industry-led. So it isn't about high in TV or creative skill set making decisions about skills investment. It's not about us as a kind of body making those decisions. We have industry groups, so we're very lucky to have a massive representation from industry who essentially tell us how to spend the money, which is industry money, so quite right too. And it means that we can make very immediate um, investments and really try and get to the crux of the issue. We invest in, obviously, everyone from new entrants, 
my personal passion very much about how do we not just find the usual suspects who've maybe been to film schools or media backgrounds how do we find people who think this industry it's not for me how on earth would i get into that you know it's about opening it up and providing those kind of straightforward opportunities to get in but we also do provide investment into supporting directors writers producers craft and tech grades so it's across the board but when you consider obviously the statistic you gave at the top saying you know 1.1 billion is spent on drama the, the money that we spend on, on investing in skills is 2.6 million. So really, it's a drop in the ocean when you consider the needs for the whole of the UK industry. How are we going to make that change? How are we going to do that? And I think we do need to look at that. We need to look at how we can sustain that and how we may need to increase that investment and how industry needs to be able to be more responsible itself to providing those opportunities to essentially train themselves. You know, we're in a different world than perhaps we were when broadcasters, Granada, BBC, provided a lot more of that um, investment in skills from within those organisations. That's, that's not as much now. So how do we as in independents and individuals do that? And I think our money increasingly is there to provide that de-risk. So I think that whole point about you know, Danny's point about, you know, bringing in a new director that perhaps wasn't um, somebody that maybe had been a first choice. It's really important. You know, the investment we make in directors or writers or producers or whatever, there's not much point, kind of, if no one's going to take the chance and actually hire them. So how can we provide perhaps de-risk investment to say, absolutely, perhaps, maybe take your first choice, but could we provide investment for you to take somebody that maybe you wouldn't take a chance on, who can be within that production, and then next time you choose them? And I think by looking a bit smarter at how we can make those investments and challenging, essentially, to change that practice about you know, you can't just keep using the same five people because, you know, they were all working. So how do we kind of change that up? And I think, I think that's really for us, it's absolutely about providing the skills investment, smartly using the money, but it's about having that conversation with industry to say, we all need to look at this challenge. How do we solve this collectively and, and be supportive for the next generation? Thank you. And, uh, and Claire, um, from obviously you based up here in Scotland, um, probably some different <clears throat> challenges perhaps than the, the London-based producers. What's, what's been your perspective on? Yeah, I think um, uh, in Scotland, which is probably representative of other, you know, the situation in other nations and maybe the regions as well, uh, the crew base <clears throat> and the editorial base does tend to be fluid between film and television. And, you know, that, that creates its own challenges, I suppose, because traditionally there has been a lot of film production in Scotland. There was, uh, I mean, going back a decade, there were at one time six network TV dramas being made in Scotland, and then uh, that all fell away. And so for about a decade, there was really no TV drama being made here, from here, if you like, which um, I think led a lot of people down a film path that we are now trying to bring over, you, you know, to sort of encourage that fluidity between the two. I think when it comes to training in Scotland, I mean, we... Clearly, it couldn't be a better time to be in nations and regions. It's never been a sexy thing to be, you know, a, a nation's producer, but it really is. It is now. now. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I did Indie Lab this year um, uh, with my company, and uh, I think we were, you know, we were, we must have been asked about 20 times, you know, like, what part of Glasgow should we move to? Because, <laughs> you know, What's it's the, the boom, uh, the West End, definitely. <laughs> uh, uh, but, uh, you know, the boom, it, it long, you know, long fought for and long waited for 25 years in the making. It's not an overnight thing for any of the different parts of the UK. But it's almost as if, like, the number of training providers in Scotland and the, the extent to which all the providers are sort of not joined up, there doesn't feel like a cohesive strategy, means that quite often you'll have three courses being run in the same thing with a massive gap over here. And yet when we come to make a high-end drama, we're still desperately looking for certain types of skills and they're not there because there hasn't been a legacy of work to bring those people you know, up and along. So there's got to be a kind of cohesive strategy. And, and I think really um, one of the issues in Scotland that, that I'm hearing about on the ground is just people not being aware of the fantastic amount of resource that we have with Creative Skillset and the opportunities. So... Hopefully Screen Scotland, the new unit, will be, you know, leading the way and bringing those agencies together. 
because it doesn't serve anybody to have five courses doing the same thing at the same time. There's low take up and then everyone thinks we don't need training in Scotland, which we absolutely do. But then the other, the challenge of it is we're a freelance industry. Yeah, yeah. So it's, I think the other thing is trying to persuade crew to invest in themselves, to think as, as individuals, to think as yourself as your own company. And what I'm seeing is I, I've seen tired crew when I was, a line producer, I used to work 30 weeks a year max. There just was not any more work than that. And I'm seeing crew that are working 50 weeks and they're exhausted. Yeah, they're not taking out time out to train, even though the money's there. So that's one challenge. And then I think the other challenge in training people up is you are asking the goodwill of a a grip to train up another grip or a location manager to train up another location manager. And people are fiercely concerned about their own livelihoods. Yeah. Mm. So you're asking a, a, a very freelance, uh, very gener asking yep. people to be very generous with their time and their skills, which, and it's, uh, to what extent are you pushing that too far? I sort of think it's, it, it, it really works. And we had a trainee uh, shadowing director on curfew, but Colin, the director was so generous with her time, with his time with her and it was brilliant to see, but you're constantly asking the same workforce to reinvest. Yeah. And I think that's great, but as producers and industry, we need to support that as much as we can and, and formalise it, because yeah. it's just unfair if someone constantly feels they're doing their job and training people up. It's yeah. got to be late. I mean, it, it needs leadership, doesn't it? Because if everybody wants, there's enough for everybody, like there's more than enough to go around up and down the UK. Again, and if we all get together, and encourage you know the industry to get behind that then that and certainly in Scotland where we are you know the targets are really real and they are you know the broadcasters will be held to account to deliver on those and and it's up to us to make sure we can make sure the industry can deliver in response to that but it's responding to the fact because that again coming back to the we from a standing start mm. the people we're asking to train up remember when they didn't work for a year so that's the that's yeah. the problem you've got you've got two levels you've got yeah. this demand that may i don't think it's going anywhere but getting people to trust that and trust in their skills yep i think specifically in scotland and it's always been the case but even more so now so we need to concentrate on consolidating talent you know we, we spend a lot of time and money on new talent and young talent you know what about the middle-aged talent you know what about, <laughs> uh, uh, what about the young at heart talent what about bringing consolidation because it, you need leadership you need people with you know senior levels of experience to deliver the range of the sort of work that we we have the opportunity to to get into i think the other thing for me about the levy, well, it was really your point, Chris, wasn't it? But I'm going to say it because you haven't said it yet. <laughs> <laughs> was that the, the, the like all these budgets, you know, ranging in scale from e even the terrestrial budgets are still pretty healthy now, but going up to the SVOD budgets, but the levy remains at the same amount, which just seems nuts when we could be generating so much more money for training yeah, by I, having a sliding scale of a levy. Yeah, because most producers are paying into levy, which is fantastic. So everybody believes, and I know, you know, so I know it's 90, ninety-three percent about ninety. It's hard compliance. to quite it's pretty, it. pretty amazing for voluntary. Yeah. But it, but it does cap out, and I think, I think again, it's it's response of how fast everything's been moving, how quickly mm. this is a sort of, I mean, creative skill set. I used to have an issue with it was just film focused and it's uh, case and the team have done an amazing job to get us all involved and actually serving us but it's only been going two years this is how quick it's all going and, and it's yeah. such a drop in the ocean when you consider you know trainee finder which is a flagship scheme for you know and a great thing to be on if you're a new entrant but it's 80 individuals in TV 80 it's tiny and it's because the investment we've got is not enough mm. and we spend nearly actually just over a million pounds on trainee finder so nearly half the budget goes on trainee finder so really if we want to be training more people and really focusing on that and I, I do take your point it's not just about the new entrant but at that side we have to look at how we find more money essentially mm. to do this and to do it well and to your point to do it together rather than this kind of splintered approach, bit of training here, a bit there. It's not joined up. So it all yeah. the, we're, well, the we're issue, having the impact. Well, the, 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 the unfortunate consequence of what happens when there's too many providers and there isn't cohesion is that, that in Scotland, there aren't enough trainees on, on the trainee finder and, or, or they're really good and they're always being used and you, know, you, can never, you can never get them. But what then happens is that productions will find a way around that and a friend of a friend or someone's daughter or someone's son suddenly is the person who's the trainee and they we get they get co-opted onto the programme, mm. which actually has the ironic outcome of, of being less 
diverse and less of a level playing field, you know, and that, there's still the thing, I think that for, you know, when we talk about diversity, it still also has to be about, you know, people, new entrants from diverse social backgrounds and from working class backgrounds and places that, um, that just that we just don't reach at the moment because we're still such a, especially in Scotland where it's a small industry, where it's word of mouth and even more so who you know, that if we could crack that, mm. we would start to see different stories being told in a really striking way. I'm going to um, go on where we've only got three or four minutes left. Just um, throw, the, throw it open to the floor for a second. I've got quite a few questions come through on the app. Does anyone want to put their hand up and ask anything? Start with the lady at the front there. Julie Craig from uh, Tay Screen, one of the regional screen offices. We work with Screen Scotland through the Scottish Locations Network. Uh, one of the things I've been aware of is, uh, for example, the under the employability scheme, which wasn't necessarily targeted. This is in Scotland, was it? But there is a similar scheme in England. It wasn't targeted on media or creative or whatever. But the concern was that it was it was very much kind of it, it, uh, the, the money was focused on people getting employment and experience, training experience in their given area. Um, and it, it, it was concerned me that, for example, we couldn't find trainees who wanted to, uh, you know, who were being put in a position to be able to, say, travel to Glasgow or travel to Edinburgh in that their travel would be covered, you know, because mm. people are coming from diverse backgrounds with really not much parental support. So I just wondered if these employability schemes, that there could be some lobbying done um, in, order, in order to get them to think a bit more, you know, forward thinking. Yeah, I front. do agree with you because I, th I, think, I think it's quite interesting you know, social inclusion, it's such a challenging issue. And I think people can be really simplistic by saying, oh, it's an opportunity, but it's, it's 50 miles away. That's okay, isn't it? Well, how am I going to get there? So you're already putting a barrier in the way and making people feel like it's not for me. So certainly for us, the programmes we look at, we absolutely look at how we try and absolutely mitigate and make sure it's open to people and provide people. We're doing an in-house runners programme at the moment where essentially we'll pay people's travel and accommodation so that they can be near that production company to work. So that's hopefully trying to kind of get across that barrier of not just saying, oh, just move, what's the problem? You know, but I do completely take your point. Again, it's slightly a drop in the ocean. You know, we need to be looking at this as a much more broader platform. Thank you. Okay. Um, lady at the, on the back on the left there. Hi, thank you. Um, uh, the ability to fund high-end drama now is pretty much restricted to either the global SVODs or a heavily deficit, deficited model or co-produced model. As producers, do you actually feel the difference between if a show is commissioned by an SVOD, generally you don't have to worry about international sales because it's fully funded and global rights are taken, whereas if the show is uh, funded by a terrestrial or normal pay TV player, there's usually a great deal of the uh, production budget to recoup from international sales. Is that um, a factor for you when you're actually making the show? Are you aware of that? Do you feel a difference between the SVODs and uh, the more linear players? And I'm, I'm going to give uh, Frith amnesty on this question since we work together. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can answer, I mean, sort of no, because when you're working, basically, if you're a grip, do you care? No, I mean... Ask me, you've got a budget, haven't you? And that's. You I know. think, the, annoyingly, it has become an issue because, as, as I said, the debunking of the finances is quite important um, to understand why someone's being paid X or Y. So, weirdly, it has sort of come on the ground. But actually, when you're making a show, your 100% focus is making that show. It's about getting talented people to make things to the best of their ability and be great and safe. Where that money coming from doesn't matter. I think where it potentially does matter um, is coming back to what you were saying about talent and when you're pers people and the risk, you're persuading, it. I guess our job as producers is to be trusted that we will make judgment calls and it's that level of involvement, be it a distributor, an SVOD or a broadcaster, um, if they if you're taking on more risk, like you did with your director, do they trust you as producers that you will see that through and deliver it? I mean, there's big sums of money now, much bigger. So that risk feels even higher. But we've got to take it. We want to take it in order to tell more interesting stories, different stories in more imaginative ways. So I think as creating a dialogue, you're ultimately making a program and hopefully whoever's investing in you whoever that money's coming from they trust you as a producer to make it and then when you're on the ground it's about making that show mm. yeah 
Unfortunately, um, I've got the uh, Please End Now sign from the back <laughs> being held up. Um, I knew half an hour wouldn't be long enough. Uh, and we could go on for another 10, 15 minutes easily. But um, I think hopefully signs, you know, we're aware of the issue and the issue is fairly clear. But uh, hopefully some signs here of, of how much work's going on to try to address the issue. And I hope, hopefully we'll be back here in a year's time, yeah. in two years' time. And come and say hi if afterwards if you've got a question. Yeah. Or... And we'll, we'll, we'll keep up the progress. But thank you very much. So big thank you to the panel.